Good morning. Uh, the first of our readings this morning is in two parts, and it's from the book of Proverbs. Uh, the first part you'll find in Proverbs chapter 2, verses 1 through to 11, and then followed by Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 through to 12. Let's remember this is God's word. Proverbs chapter 2. Moral benefits of wisdom. My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, and if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord gives wisdom and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He holds victory in store for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk, whose walk is blameless. For he guards the course of the just and protects the way of his faithful ones. Then you will understand what is right and just and fair. Every good path. For wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will protect you, and understanding will guard you. And continuing chapter 3. Further benefits of wisdom. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you, Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. Amen. We're going to have a second reading now, and it comes from the New Testament book of Hebrews. Uh, it's on, in chapter 12, and we're going to be reading from verses 4 through to verses 13. So let's hear God's word. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? And if you're not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we've all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Make level paths for your feet, so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. And this is God's word.
If you could uh, keep the Hebrews passage open, we're going to be starting there this morning. And uh, shall we pray for God's help as we open up his word together? Let's pray. Father, you've promised in your word that if we seek, we will find. So help us today, we pray, to seek with faith, to lean not on our own understanding, but seek to know you today and in everything. And we pray that you might give us wisdom, that you might speak to us, and that we might know you and all things in you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, we... We are focusing this morning on the Old Testament book of Proverbs, chapters 2 and 3, but I want to begin with this New Testament letter to the Hebrews, and particularly with uh, verse 5, a phrase there where the preacher to the Hebrews uh, introduces his quotation from the book of Proverbs. Do you see verse 5? The preacher asks, Have you forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons? Last week, we began looking at the book of Proverbs, and we learned that much of Proverbs is the wisdom of great King Solomon, the king of ancient Israel, who was given a special gift of wisdom. And now, in writing Proverbs, he's passing on that wisdom to his sons. You can think of Proverbs, then, as a sort of a princely training manual, uh, enabling his sons to take up their roles in ancient Israel as princes and future kings. But we may be thinking, well, I'm not planning to be a prince in ancient Israel any time soon. And so is is Solomon's wisdom really relevant for me today? Well, what I love about this phrase in the book of Hebrews is it, it reminds us that Proverbs addresses us as God's people today, as sons. In Jesus Christ, Solomon's greater son, we are all God's sons and daughters And so the the book of Proverbs is written to us to help us to live as God's sons and daughters, God's princes and princesses, if you like, and to know the wisdom that God, our Heavenly Father, has for us. And then the other thing I like about this phrase in the book of Hebrews is it reminds us that, that Proverbs is written as a word of encouragement. You can see in that passage from Hebrews that that often wisdom isn't easy. The path of wisdom is often painful the preacher to the Hebrews says. It's difficult and there's a danger of losing heart. And so we need encouragement to pursue wisdom. And that is exactly what Solomon's giving us, particularly in these opening chapters of the book of Proverbs. He gives us all sorts of encouragements to seek wisdom. And so we can think of Proverbs as God's fatherly word of encouragement through King Solomon to his sons and daughters in Jesus Christ. Over the past number of weeks, one of the things I've enjoyed doing most is teaching one of my children to ride a bike without stabilizers for the first time. And I can remember my own dad teaching me to do that uh, many years ago. And thinking about it, it seems to me that it's often one of our earliest memories, learning to ride a bike. I guess that's because of all the bumps and scrapes we encounter as we're learning to ride a bike for the first time. And perhaps we can also remember our mum or our dad cheering us on as we began to take those first uh, steps and first pedals. And perhaps we can also remember when we cracked it and we could finally sail off and sort of glide almost effortlessly along the pavement. Well, it strikes me that learning wisdom is something like learning to ride a bike. It can be painful and difficult at times. Um, But eventually there is the wonderful fruit that wisdom can give us, wisdom's blessings. And so what we need are encouragements, fatherly encouragements, to seek wisdom, to invest in this path of walking in wisdom's way. Well, last week, Solomon alerted us to some of the dangers of ignoring wisdom as she cries aloud above the tumult. But this week, Solomon moves more positively to give us a sense of what the great goodness of wisdom is. Solomon wants to impress upon us that wisdom is wonderfully good. And what he gives us is a sort of an A, B, C of wisdom's goodness. The A and the B are going to come from chapter 2, which are all one sentence in Hebrew. And the structure of it is fairly obvious in Hebrew, even if it's not um, to us. And then uh, the C is going to come from chapter 3. So if you 
uh, would like to turn back to Proverbs chapter 2 and 3 with me. And we're going to see firstly uh, that wisdom is available to all. And this is coming from verses two, uh, 1 to 11 of chapter 2. And you can see in these verses there's a sort of an if-then structure to them. And Solomon is wanting to stress that if we seek wisdom, then we will find it. So have a look at verse 1. He says, My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding, and if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. So this is Solomon's first word of encouragement. He says to us, wisdom is available. And so it's worth investing in, it's worth seeking, because if we seek it, we will find it. It's a bit like a, a dad saying to his child as they get on the bike and they've fallen off a number of times, keep going, practice makes perfect, you'll get there in the end. Wisdom is available to all. So whether you're young or old, whether you consider yourself to be a brain box or have never been top of the class, Solomon wants you to know that wisdom, the Lord's wisdom, is available to you today. Well, how can he be so sure of that? Well, have a look at verse 6. Solomon reminds us that it is the Lord who gives wisdom, and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Wisdom, at the end of the day, is not so much something that we discover through our own intellect, but it's something that we receive as a gift from the mouth of God. And that's why Solomon can guarantee it. If anybody seeks it, the Lord promises that we will find it because he'll give us wisdom. But of course, not everybody is wise as we look around our world. And there's lots of reasons for that, but one of them is that you do have to look for wisdom. It's available, but you've got to look for it. It's a little bit like a treasure hunt. Do you see verse 4? You have to look for it as for silver and search for it as for hidden treasure. And the image of, I have in my mind as I read those words is of some of those 1900s kind of videos of black and white footage where people are rushing towards uh, the rivers in the west of the United States of America because they're going to go panning for gold in the gold rush. Uh, and perhaps more recently, we might uh, have the image in our minds of having a list of essential items uh, that we need to kind of collect from the supermarket, and we're going to feverishly wander around the supermarket to make sure we have those essential items. That's how Solomon wants us to approach wisdom, as something that we need to urgently look for. And he doesn't uh, hide away from us how we're going to find this treasure. Uh, he really gives it to us in two ways that we look for this treasure. Firstly, uh, in verses 1 and 2, he says that we have to listen carefully. My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying your heart to understanding. So listen, Solomon says, to my words. They will bring you God's wisdom, especially as you reflect on them and hide them in your heart. And then secondly, though, we don't do this by ourselves. Verse 3, you also have to call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding. So listen carefully, pray for understanding, and Solomon says that God will make his wisdom known to you. So perhaps you don't feel very wise this morning, but you want to be. Well, Solomon says you can be if you'll listen carefully to his words, if you'll ask for understanding into them then Solomon says, you will be wise. The Lord will give you his wisdom. So that's the A. Wisdom is available to all. But perhaps you're not persuaded uh, about that at the moment. Perhaps you're not persuaded that this is an investment that you want to make or a treasure hunt that you want to go on. Well, in that case, you need the B of wisdom's goodness. You need to understand that wisdom brings great blessing. Solomon uses all kinds of images, doesn't he, here, for, uh, how, to show us how good wisdom is. He uses the image of gold and silver. He uses the image of hidden treasure. He uses the image of jewelry, uh, the image of a tree that gives life, 
and of medicine that gives health to our bones. But in the verses in the second half of uh, chapter 2, Solomon sets out specifically how wisdom brings great blessing to us. Have a look at verse 12, first of all. Solomon says, Wisdom will save you from the ways of wicked men, from men whose words are perverse. And then verse 16, he says, Wisdom will save you also from the adulteress, from the wayward wife, with her seductive words. Now these are two kind of stereotyped characters that we meet often in the book of Proverbs, the wayward men, the wicked men, sorry, and the wayward wife. They're stereotypes to help to alert us to two common distractions and dangers for us. On the one hand, you've got the wicked men with their violence and aggression and power, and on the other hand, you've got the wayward wife with her seductive words, her temptations, her pleasures. And Solomon wants his sons to navigate between these two dangers. And he says that the great blessing of wisdom is that it will save us from these disastrous people who surround us. So this is Solomon's second word of encouragement. He encourages us that wisdom brings great blessing. It enables us to navigate through life without wobbling to either side on the wrong path. Well, perhaps that feels like a bit of a, a letdown to you. Solomon uses all these grand images to talk about how brilliant wisdom is, but what it boils down to is avoiding sin and living uh, righteously. And we may think, well, hang on. We've got the rest of the Bible to tell us about how to live rightly and how to avoid sin. Don't we turn to Proverbs for something a bit more practical than that? You know, if we're struggling to know how we're going to pay our mortgage or we've got a big decision to make, we turn to, to Proverbs for practical wisdom. I must say that there's been times in my life when I've turned to Proverbs for a bit of emergency wisdom and I've, I've been quite disappointed to find that it basically tells me that I need to be good. But of course, that is to ignore a fundamental reality. The main thing that stops us living good, successful, prosperous, and healthy lives in the world that God has put us in is sin. Think about it. Sin corrodes our confidence. Sin saps our energy. Sin chokes our relationships. Sin leaves us trapped in cycles of temptation and anger and shame. Proverbs, if you like, wants us to see that whatever harm sin does to other people, sin is always tantamount to self-harm. Have a look at verses 18 and 19. You see that the, the house of the wayward woman leads down to death, Solomon warns his son, and her paths to the spirits of the dead. None who go to her return or attain the paths of life. If you want to live, the Lord says to us, avoid sin. Proverbs wants to wake us up to the stupidity of sin. Or more positively, we could say that Solomon wants to teach us that it's smart to be sanctified, that holiness leads to happiness. Not necessarily immediately, not today perhaps, but over the long haul. In the end, in God's world, to live his way is to have life. You see some of that in verse 20. Thus, Solomon says, as you receive wisdom, as you avoid these uh, characters, you will walk in the ways of good men and keep to the paths of the righteous. For the upright will live in the land and the blameless will remain in it. But the wicked will be cut off from the land and the unfaithful will be torn from it. Wisdom can bless us by helping us, if you like, to keep our balance, to not be going off the path of life. And particularly in a difficult world where there is sin, where there is difficulties that surround us, we need wisdom to help us to stay on the right track in all the ins and outs of life. Well, Solomon's shown us that wisdom is available to all and it brings, brings great blessing. And now he's ready to seal the deal. 
And that's what he does in chapter 3. He tells us that wisdom calls for commitment. Now, there's no point, is there, riding a bike half-heartedly. You know that you've just got to go for it if you're going to stay on the bike. And in a similar way, you've got to commit to following the path of wisdom. And this is the, the third word of encouragement Solomon has uh, for his son. He urges his son to go for it. So have a look at verse 5, chapter 3. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him or literally know him. Know the Lord in all your ways and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. So do you see there are three uh, encouragements, three challenges to us. Trust in the Lord, fear the Lord, honor the Lord and do it with all your heart, in all your ways and with all your crops, all your possessions. If you do that, Solomon says, then there'll be abundant blessings in every facet of your life. Wisdom requires that we give all of what belongs to God all the time. And it's stupid not to do that because God is at the very center of life. Well, it's stupid not to do that, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's always easy. We said wisdom's blessings don't necessarily come all at once or straight away. And so the Lord through Solomon gives us lots more motives in chapter 3 uh, to continue to seek wisdom. And we're just going to skim through these uh, very briefly. So follow along with me as you can. Verses 11 and 12, Solomon reminds his son that the Lord disciplines those he loves. And so if hardship's coming, if it's feeling like the path of wisdom's difficult, Solomon says, remember that there's pain before gain. And the reason that he can be so confident of gain, verses 13 to 18, is because wisdom is the most profitable investment you could ever make. And that's why the Lord disciplines us for our good. Because if we get wisdom, she's more precious than rubies, verse 15. Nothing you can desire can compare with her. She's a tree of life, verse 18, to all who embrace her. Those who lay hold of her will be blessed. And why is that? Why is wisdom such a source of blessing? Well, Solomon says, verses 19 and 20, wisdom is written into the very DNA, the very fabric of the universe. Verse 19, by wisdom, the Lord laid the earth's foundations. By understanding, he set the heavens in place. By his knowledge, the deeps were divided and the clouds let drop the dew. If you align yourself with the wisdom of the Lord, Solomon says, you are aligning yourself with the very structure of reality. Reality isn't chaotic or a mess or disordered ultimately. It is in the Lord's hands. He established the world in wisdom and he makes that wisdom known to us so that we can live his way. So this is Solomon's third word of encouragement then. Trust in the Lord, he says, with all your heart. Commit to walking in the way of wisdom. Now, it'll be easy to close our Bibles and to stop there and to see that we've got the basic A, B, C of wisdom. But that might leave us, as we go away from here in the middle of the week, as we're unlocking our car, as we're doing our shopping, as we're talking to our neighbors, it might leave us guessing whether we really are trusting in the Lord with all our hearts. What does it mean exactly to trust in the Lord with all your heart? It's one of those things preachers can say and sometimes leave it a thousand feet up in the air and not bring it into reality. And one of the wonderful things about the book of Proverbs is it won't leave things hanging high in the air. Solomon wants to ground everything in our daily lives. And so towards the end of the chapter, Solomon gives us four particular case studies that help us to see ways that we might not be trusting in the Lord with all our hearts. And looking at these will help us to see what he's looking for in terms of trusting in the Lord in all our ways. 
Now, I'm just going to pick out the final two of these today uh, to illustrate this and to get a flavor of what Solomon's talking about. So two telltale signs that we might not be trusting in the Lord with all our hearts. Have a look firstly at verse 30. Solomon says to his sons, do not accuse a man for no reason when he's done you no harm. It's actually quite easy to fall into this, isn't it? We probably all know people who are like to write letters to the council at the drop of a hat. Or we all know people who maybe tell the teacher or tell uh, mum and dad to almost willy-nilly, whenever anything's gone wrong, they're straight there to complain about it, to accuse somebody else. And it's not, it's not bad. It's, it's quite an easy thing to fall into because obviously we do want to have respect for the authorities. But Solomon says to his sons, don't do it if somebody hasn't really done you any real harm, if there's no real need to do this, don't go uh, accusing other people willy-nilly. Because if you do have that kind of attitude, it may be that you're not really trusting in the Lord with all your heart. Have a look at verse 35. Solomon ends the chapter by, by reminding his sons that the wise inherit honor, but fools he holds up, the Lord holds up, to shame. We don't have to go complaining or accusing willy-nilly because the Lord will ensure that folly is exposed eventually himself. We, we can kind of rest in that. And we can trust that we don't have to kind of go and get honor for ourselves or make sure that everything's right all around us all the time because the Lord will, will give us honor, will inherit honor if we walk in his ways. So there's the first uh, kind of case study, how to tell if you're not trusting in the Lord with all your heart. If you're the sort of person who accuses people, complains about people willy-nilly, then you may not be trusting in the Lord with all your heart. Well, how about the second one? Uh, verse 31. Solomon uh, urges his sons, do not envy a violent man or choose any of his ways. Well, do we ever do this, I wonder? Are you ever tempted to fire off a venomous email or social media post that just absolutely takes somebody down? You know they sort of deserve it, uh, but you know that you're also not really meant to act that way because that's the way that violent men behave, just slamming people uh, willy-nilly. But sometimes we wish we could be like that, don't we? We wish that we didn't have to be so nice all the time, that, that sort of being a Christian sort of constricts us a bit and sometimes you'd like to let rip. And perhaps some of the video games that we pr play uh, show us that we are envying the ways of the violent men. Or, or what about the films that we often watch? Do we get a kick out of imagining for a few hours that we could be violent men and go around causing havoc? Well, if that is us, if we are tempted sometimes to envy the ways of the violent, I wonder, does that forget the Lord? Does that show that we're not trusting in the Lord with all our heart? Does it forget, verse 34, that the Lord mocks proud mockers, but gives grace to the humble? The Lord's ways are really good. All his paths are peace. Of course, there's times to contend and strive. But we need to be people who are seeking peace, who are not envying the ways of the violent, because we trust that the Lord knows what he's doing, and he's shown us the good way to live. Well, those are two ways that Solomon helps us to kind of get a flavor of whether we are trusting in the Lord with all our heart. And if we're not, then he encourages us to see that wisdom is available to us all. It brings great blessing as it calls us to commit to trusting in the Lord in all our ways. Well, if all of that makes us feel unwise this morning, as it, to be honest, makes me feel unwise, we need to remember that all of these words are spoken to us as sons in the Lord Jesus Christ. In Christ, God has put all our follies behind his back. And now, as his sons and daughters in Christ, he set us again on the good and right way. And he calls us to follow Christ in living rightly, trusting in him and living to his praise. So shall we ask God to help us to do that as we uh, go into this coming week? Let's pray. 
Our Father God, we thank you this morning that you've called us your sons and daughters through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you that you don't leave us in the dark, that although we became fools by turning from you, we thank you that you give us your wisdom again so clearly to enable us to live rightly, to live well in this world you've placed us in. Father, help us to be people who will commit to this course of following wisdom, to not give up if we get a few bumps and scrapes, but to follow your ways, hearing your call of encouragement and trusting in our Savior, Jesus Christ, to empower us, to show us the way, to forgive us when we go wrong, and to bring us one day to eternal glory. And so it's in his name that we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite Graham and Jill Simpson, some of our elders, to come and lead us in our prayers of intercession now. Let's pray. Father, we come before you today and we thank you for being with us. Thank you that you are a good, good father who loves us, your children. Thank you that you are forever faithful and we know you will not let us down. So we come now praying in confidence that you hear our prayers and you will answer them according to your perfect will for our good and for your glory. Philippians 4 verse 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. In yesterday's news, we hear that in South Africa, five people were killed in a church siege in Johannesburg. Father, we don't know why or how this came about, but we do know there are five families grieving the loss of loved ones and the community is living in fear. Father, we would ask that you would comfort those who are mourning and that you would bring peace and calm to this troubled community. Yesterday in Bosnia, people were reminded of man's inhumanity to man as they held a ceremony to mark the 25th anniversary of the massacre in Srebrenica, where 8,000 Muslim men and boys were massacred. Father, we ask that your Holy Spirit would be poured out upon that land and would bring peace to those who still mourn the loss of loved one 25 years on. But all is not bad in the world, Father. We give thanks. We want to thank you for the good things in our world, for our relationships with churches in other countries, for our brothers and sisters in Gilgal Church in Rwanda, in Moldova, Hungary, and the Lighthouse Church in Japan, where our much-loved sister Helen Little serves. We give thanks that they faithfully proclaim your gospel. We thank you that they have been able to give practical help and support to those in need in their communities in these difficult times. Father, we pray for government. We bring before you the governments in Westminster, in Stormont, and in Dublin. We pray that they would listen and act on good advice as they seek to lead us safely out of lockdown. And we give thanks for all those who have been working on the front line and pray your continued protection upon them and their families. We pray for the scientists who are working on a vaccine. Give them knowledge and great wisdom as they work towards this. And Father, we pray for those within our congregation and for those who are joining with us online. We pray for those who have recently been bereaved. Father, would you comfort them? May they know your peace and your presence and give them strength for the days ahead. For those who are sick, we pray that they will receive the very best treatment. Lord, would you handpick the very best medical people to deal with their situations? And we pray for healing in Jesus' name, if it be your will. And for those awaiting results of tests, Lord, be near to them. May they sense your peace. May they know that as they wait, you are still working for their good and for your glory. And for those with anxious hearts, worried about family, worried about jobs, worried about finances, 
Father, would you give them a sense of calm. May they know that you are in control and have each of their situations in hand. And may they rest in your presence as they wait. For those who are feeling isolated, lonely and struggling with lockdown, may they know your presence. Holy Spirit, bring comfort to them at this difficult time. We pray for local businesses and employers as they strive to cope with all the many difficulties COVID-19 has created. Give them great wisdom and clarity for the way ahead. And we want to pray for our ministry team in Bloomfield, our Kirk Session and our church committee. And we pray that you would give them wisdom as they lead us and especially as they make plans and preparations for us to meet together again in this church building. We pray that you would lead and guide them according to your perfect will. May we as a church be a shining light in this community. May we honour you in all that we do and say and help us, Lord, to show your love to those around us. And as we prayed at the start of our prayers, we remind ourselves again of the verses in Philippians 4, 6. Don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good, will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. And so we ask all these things with confidence and in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.